In my last lecture, I mentioned Picasso's jealous reaction to Matisse's The Joy of Life. This painting was Picasso's counterthrust. Many art historians consider it to be his finest work. We'll get to this in a moment, but first, a little more about Picasso. Since he painted throughout the 20th century, he straddles a bunch of our isms. And really, Picasso can't be confined to a single category. So here, for example, is a work that was painted during what art historians call Picasso's Blue Period. Note that it is still mostly representational, although the perspective is distorted and colors are used expressionistically. Picasso was a child prodigy who became, arguably, the most important painter of the 20th century. He was producing saleable drawings by the time he had turned nine, and by 1900, when he'd reached the ripe old age of 19, he was turning out a painting every day. He kept painting until his death at age 92, and he died by far the richest artist in history. During this long lifetime, he is estimated to have produced more than 30,000 works of art. This group of paintings show his characteristic fracturing of figures. Excuse me, the one on the upper right is actually a sculpture. And some are more representational than others. Some employ a soft color palette, others deep, bright colors. Again, it's hard to put Picasso into a box. So I thought the Khan Academy video on this work was especially good, and I'm not going to repeat it, except to note that this is a deliberately in-your-face painting designed to provoke exactly the kind of reaction from viewers that it mostly received in 1907. Shock? revulsion, and on the part of some artists, an understanding, a realization that Picasso was moving art in a whole new direction. People could not be indifferent to this painting. I've already mentioned the influence of African art on expressionist painters such as Duran and Matisse. In this painting, the mask motif should be clear. So were the distortion, flattened space, fragmented bodies, and black lines used as a grid or scaffolding. After the brilliant colors of the Expressionists, which were sometimes bright and pure and sometimes harsh and jarring, we now encounter a much more limited, pa limited palette of pinks, grays, blues, and browns. Actually, art historians debate whether Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is an Expressionist work or the first Cubist painting. I've rather arbitrarily stuck it in my Cubism lecture. Note, too, that the composition, like Cezanne's still life and landscape paintings, is filled with contradictory points of view, deliberately disorienting the viewer. So we look down at the table at the bottom of the campus, but we encounter the nudes head on. We see the eyes full face and the noses in profile. The seated figure on the lower right faces her colleagues, but manages to turn her head 180 degrees to look at us. Ouch. We've already seen a move toward abstraction. In fact, in the case of Kandinsky, we've really already arrived there. But it's important to understand that artists had different reasons for creating more abstract art. Some artists, such as Kandinsky and Mondrian, whom we'll encounter soon, were seeking spiritual transcendence. They were looking for a kind of escape from the material world into a deeper underlying reality. But especially early in the 20th century, most abstract artists were not so much escaping the material world as trying to distill, maybe if you will, to deconstruct its essential qualities and to capture those qualities in painting and sculpture. And the Cubists fit into the second category. Cubists themselves, perhaps appropriately, would splinter into different schools and the movement would evolve. It began with analytical Cubism. Really, that meant Picasso and Brock. They saw themselves as dissectors. They were looking for essential shapes and how these shapes interact with the negative space around them, especially when, again, seen from multiple perspectives, and especially when displayed on a two-dimensional surface. Remember, this is the age of Einstein. Relativistic time and space were all the rage. Here's a very early Cubist painting. Just a year after Demoiselle d'Avignon, Picasso is reducing the house and garden to simplified geometric forms, but he still depicts an identifiable house, garden, and garden wall, and delineates them partly by using color differences. We see the same features in this early Cubist painting by Georges Braque. This could almost be a Cezanne. Braque is still moving toward abstraction. But here, 
in our next recorded work, Brock has pretty much arrived at full-throated cubism. In analytical cubist paintings, not only the figures fragment, the distinction between an object and its surrounding space, space breaks down as well. This blurring of positive and negative space is enhanced by the almost monochromatic colors. The Portuguese was a musician whom Brock saw in a bar. Note how Brock asks the viewer not only to look for familiar shapes associated with musicians, such as the sound hole in the guitar, but also to read into the painting what we already know about the subject from the title. Brock also inserts text into the painting, but not really text with clear meaning related to the Portuguese. It's not, in other words, a text we can easily interpret. Maybe the message here is that we need to read meaning into a painting. Certainly, Picasso and Brock believed that viewers needed to learn how to read cubist paintings, just as they had to learn to read illusionistic paintings that employed inner perspective. So we don't have a synthetic cubist work, but analytic cubism smashes an object to see all of its individual pieces, and the next stage of cubism, which began in 1912, saw Picasso and Brock taking those individual pieces and then reassembling them in a new way, Hence, the term synthesis, or putting together. And in the process, they invented the collage. Again, although none of these works show up on the list, they influence works that do, such as Stepanova's photo montage, which we'll get to soon. So here's an example of synthetic cubism and also one of Picasso's most famous works. During the synthetic cubism phase, Picasso and Brock began incorporating real objects into their paintings, something that would continue into the 21st century. Remember Trade uh, by Jean Quick to see Smith? Here are three Brock collages with actual newspaper articles glued into the painting. I'm really just including this because I think it's so fun. This Picasso collage dates from what is known as Picasso's Rococo Cubist period. You remember Rococo art, I hope? So, we see the evocation of luxury items, a hint of aristocratic decadence, and it's just plain fun. Picasso here has also returned to more vivid colors. He kind of switches back and forth during his career. This is actually a sculpture made from sheet metal. Even in three-dimensional object, Picasso is playing with the juxtaposition of two and three-dimensional depictions of space and volume. We don't have any cubist sculpture on the list, but I wanted you to see some. And I'm going to hit you with one last ism before I close. Some artists, most notably the famous architect Le Corbusier, criticized cubism, arguing it was too cerebral, too much a creation of the mind, and just too out of touch with the realities of modern life, and especially the modern machine age. Purists admired what they saw as the clean, functional lines of modern machines, but they were fascinated by the cubist dissection of objects in space. Leger is the best known of the purest painters. In this painting, he tries to capture the infrastructure and pulsing life of the modern city. Again, this is a painting I particularly like. I don't know if you have time left. If you do, this video clip gives a fascinating insight into the sources Picasso used to create this iconic